my pleasure to introduce uh, Joe Isaac from Duke University. Professor Isaac uh, received his Bachelor of Masters and PhD degree from MIT, and then uh, went on to Case Western University. Uh, he became a professor. He also he, before that he was a postdoc at MIT as well, working first uh, as a PhD with uh, Michael Sell, and then uh, with Fujimoto the postdoc. Uh, and then became a professor at uh, Duke University. Uh, today he's going to talk about, I guess, uh, his preferred <coughs> team, which is Africa and Korea and Thank you for coming. Thanks very much, Raphael. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks. I want to uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. As many of you know, whose appointment I didn't show up for, I, <laughs> I actually just got here. Uh, I was I missed my connection last night by a few minutes and. Uh, and it spent, spent most of the day getting here. So I'm sorry to those that I, who, the appointments I missed. Uh, part of the reason I was anxious to come so far is because I've, uh, I know a lot of people from here, and, uh, and, and, but have not, never been to, uh, to Colorado uh, at Boulder, uh, which is one of the main optics places there are. So um, I'm in the biomedical engineering department at, at, at Duke. Um, my topic today is uh, we try to find ways not to say optical coherence tomography, but I, I've been involved in the development of optical coherence tomography uh, basically since its inception, and I'm going to talk uh, about that from a couple of different uh, um, directions. Um, I wanted to mention, actually, I, I didn't have time to put the slide in here, so we have a couple of connections. I know several people here. One of the <coughs> connections is, is Christina Johnson. Uh, Christina Johnson recruited me to Duke to uh, help set up the, biomedic, or the biophotonics laboratory at the uh, photonics center that, that she built there. Uh, I, I meant to put in a picture of the pretty building that she built for us before she moved on. I know she has some history here, and she's been several other places since she left our place, too, uh, which isn't surprising. Um, okay, so let me get right into this. I was, I, I've got about 40 slides, and I was planning on talking for about 40 or 45 minutes, although I, I tend to go long. So um, I also didn't get a chance to talk to enough people to know exactly who, who you people are. Uh, exactly. How many physicists versus engineers do we have? Physicists? Okay. Engineers, probably all the same people, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. We have some, some applied oh, chemists. Okay, okay, good. Uh, thank you for that. So I, I work mostly at the intersection of engineering and, and medical imaging. Uh, I work in en engineering of optical imaging systems for, uh, for, bio for, for medical imaging applications. I'm really not a microscopist. I have lots of friends who are, who are microscopists. Uh, but I don't pretend to be. We're really more macroscopic than that. Uh, with coherence-based techniques, we're on the order of a few microns resolution. What we really, really specialize in is getting deep imaging in highly scattering tissues. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, going over sort of the introduction to how we do that with coherence-based techniques, why it works, uh, before I get to, to sort of more cutting-edge stuff. Uh, first, let me start out by saying my university uh, 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 enforces me to say that I have, uh, I have proprietary interest in some of what I'm talking about. I'm a co-founder of a company uh, whose products are related to some of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I won't be secretive about that at all. Um, and here's what I'm going to talk about. So I'll talk first about the, the basis of, of, of coherence-based imaging in, in highly scattering tissues, how this has turned into a fairly successful uh, clinical imaging application in optical coherence tomography, uh, how that is basically advanced to the point where it's, it's been now commercialized and commoditized and gotten out of our hands, and so we need other things to do. And so we're, we're moving on to functional imaging and other aspects of coherence imaging uh, going a step beyond what has actually been uh, so far commercially successful. Uh, this is a, 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 a brief trace of, of, of citations of optical coherence tomography in, in, in the web of science up through a, a year and a half ago. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been growing very, very rapidly since basically the first publication in, in 1991. Um, uh, now there's on the order of a thousand publications a year that use this. Most of them, these green ones here, are in ophthalmology. Since 1995, you've been able to, if you're an ophthalmologist, been able to buy an optical coherence tomography uh, imager and use it on your patients. And so a lot of these publications are ophthalmologists doing patient type of studies on what they can see what they can resolve, but there's lots of other stuff. There's technical technology development, um, and then there's other clinical applications of this technology as well. Okay, so what are we after here? You guys are all informed. I'm gonna take my coat off, if you don't mind. <coughs> well, what we're basically after with the coherence techniques I'm gonna talk about today is trying to see deep into tissues. So as you know, tissues are highly scattering, much more highly scattering than absorbing. 
And then the other processes that most of you probably spend a lot of time at looking at if you're, if you're microscopist are even less likely to happen than that. Scattering is, is the dominant effect. The scattering, uh, the scattering uh, uh, length in, in typical tissues at about in the red is on the order of 50 microns. Uh, the absorption coefficient is actually a lot less. So the, the average distance between absorption effects is typically a few millimeters. Scattering is so much more important than absorption. Scattering dominates. If you're trying to see through a tissue, and that is see deep into a tissue to actually do biomedical imaging with light akin to three-dimensional imaging, such as MRI or CT type scanning that you can do with other types of radiation, you want to be able to see as deep as you can while maintaining the, the best resolution that you can. What you'll find is that because there's such a big difference here, if you start with no scattered light and then you go deeper and deeper, you're going to find that the, the ratio of scattered to unscattered component just grows ridiculously large. And so if you actually want to image more than a few hundred microns into, into tissue, you need to have very, very good discrimination between scattered and unscattered light if your imaging system is based on the, un, on the, on the unscattered component. In OCT, what we're typically looking at is the backscattered component, which is really just one, one backscatter away from being a transmission experiment. So we really have the same issue to deal with. We are looking at a few photons in a sea of 10 to the 14 or 15 more photons that have been multiply scattered, and therefore we really don't know where they've been. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing you might think about doing is collimating. Okay, so you're familiar with this from, from X-ray. This is the same thing as confocal microscopy. So it's just a, Fourier, it's just a spatial Fourier transform of, 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 uh, of, mi of confocal microscopy. If you use spatial gating by putting collimators, by sending in a light in that's collimated and putting collimators after it to detect only the light that goes straight through, it's a little bit complicated to show, but it's a pretty good rule of thumb that for tissue-like uh, for tissue like uh, scattering media and for near infrared uh, wavelengths, after about a half millimeter of tissue thickness, the amount of light coming out in the same mode that it went in that's been multiply scattered begins to dominate over that that has not been scattered. So if you're trying to image using either collimators or a confocal microscope into anything that looks like tissue in the near infrared, you're not going to see deeper than on the order of half a millimeter deep before your, it's not that your photons go away, it's that your contrast goes away. You simply lose contrast because you're collecting more photons that have been multiply scattered than have been directly scattered back. So confocal geometric imaging isn't going to do it for you if you want to see deeper than that. So what's the next thing you can use? The next thing, of course, is timing. And so this is how ultrafast optics got involved in, in, biomedical, in optical biomedical imaging. If you time the path length of going through, then, of course, you can pick out the earliest arriving photons if you used a short pulse going in and therefore get another handle on, on, on which, which photons have gone on a straight line. So there, this was sort of the, the, uh, of great interest in sort of the late 80s and 90s when, when, when femtosecond lasers were first coming on and were first being used in these applications. Fairly short time after that, it occurred to people that instead of using very expensive uh, and very hard to generate short pulses, we could use coherence to do exactly the same thing because it's really the coherence length, not the pulse length which is sort of a superset of coherence length, right, that we're really interested in. And we can actually make exactly the same measurement by using low coherence interferometry. interferometry. So if we stick our sample in one arm of a simple Michelson interferometer illustrated here with a broadband source, so a white light interferometer, and we consider the sample to be built up of maybe a, a series of individual reflections, then each reflection in the sample generates reflected light, and by scanning the reference delay, all we're basically doing is an optical cross-correlation of the fields in both sample and reference arms. The optical cross-correlation function is just this little fringe burst. You know from the Wiener-Kinchin theorem that the autocorrelation function of any field is a Fourier transform of its power spectral density. So this shape is already generated by the inverse transform of the uh, power spectrum of the light source. So for a light source with a finite center frequency and some bandwidth, you're going to get some oscillations inside the fringes and some, uh, and some envelope uh, having to do with the coherence length. If we now have a series of reflections in the sample, we can think of a series of reflections as being a convolution of the autocorrelation function and the function representing the distribution of reflections in the sample. And therefore, what happens when we scan this reference is we get a, a different fringe burst for every reflection in the sample, whose position and amplitude tells us something about where those reflections were inside the sample. And so the first generation of, of OCT uh, basically did just that. They just scanned the reference arm and looked for where the different reflections showed up. Now, if we want to think of this as a form of microscopy, we can't forget that we're actually also focusing this beam inside our sample, and we need to see what happens there. So if we think of a simple confocal microscope, 
as its point spread function is being given by the convolution of the point spread function of the, of the pupil functions of both objectives in a confocal microscope, we can think now of an optical coherence tomography instrument at, which we're delivering through the same microscope as just adding on another point spread function, that point spread function being the envelope of this autocorrelation function. Okay? And since there is a Fourier transform relationship between that and the power spectrum of the light source, we can do a form of point spread, point spread function engineering here by shaping, the point, the, by shaping the power spectrum of our light source, generating the point spread function that we want to give us a depth discrimination in the tissue corresponding to the, the same thing as, as timing, and that then goes on top of the confocal response of the actual microscope that we use. Now, I actually don't pull this slide out very much, only for microscopists. In fact, in OCT, we almost never talk about this. We always use such low numerical aperture focusing in OCT that we basically never even think about the confocal parameter other than in very simple terms. We don't build very sophisticated uh, uh, um, uh, microscopes in OCT. I'll tell you why in just, in just a second. So here's now the picture I'm trying to build of uh, uh, an original time domain so-called OCT uh, interferometer. Uh, if we have uh, a Michelson interferometer set up as here, now we can borrow technology from uh, semiconductor light sources and receivers, fiber optics, give us nice single mode beams. We don't have to do any spatial filtering other than getting them in and out of the fibers. We can, build, we can have a reference, which is just a scanning mirror on a, on, a, on a translating delay. And then here, I should be using the pointer, shouldn't I? Here is a scanning confocal microscope, which is using the output of that single mode fiber as a point source and then uh, scanning it across the sample surface and then recollecting it back through that same single mode aperture, generating a confocal microscope here and adding on the coherence information here. So as we scan this back and forth, we generate these fringe bursts, we do a little processing to look at their envelope. Each of these ones we call by analogy to, a, to ultrasound an A-scan. And then when we move this, when we scan this sideways across the tissue surface, we generate a two-dimensional image, which we call a B-scan. Again, that's the terminology from ultrasound. The way we normally think of OCT, the resolutions in the axial and lateral dimensions are, are decoupled. They're not really. I just showed you that slide that showed that the, actually the, the axial resolution has a, has a geometric focusing component to it. But in the limit that, we're, that we usually look at, the axial resolution, which is given by the coherence length of the light source, is typically a few microns. This is limited by the available sources. So we want to build these things for medical imaging applications. We don't want to use femtosecond lasers. We don't want to use sunlight and have to integrate for hours. We want to use practical light sources. So, so what we're limited to is practical semiconductor, uh, 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 semicon uh, superluminescent diodes is what is typically used, which are sources that can generate a few milliwatts of power with a few, uh, ten typically 50 or 60 nanometers or maybe a few hundred nanometers, uh, if you put a couple of them together, of bandwidth. That gives us a few microns of axial resolution, the coherence length. And then the lateral resolution, we basically just designed to match this, to give us isotropic resolution. And so getting a few microns of lateral resolution in this confocal microscope means it's a very simple and easy to build uh, confocal microscope. Simple and easy enough to build that we can actually put it inside an endoscope uh, fairly easily or put it in medical instrumentation and interface it with patients in a way that, that, that we don't have to have a, a very complicated microscope uh, in order to do it. Okay. Okay, so I'm actually trying to go quickly over the early history here. So th this, this basic uh, uh, topology for OCT was, was developed in the early 90s and, and demonstrated first for its most important application to date, which is imaging of the retina. I'll talk a lot more about that in just a few minutes about actually the optics involved in that. It was also dem demonstrated for imaging of small animals, and I'll show a little bit more about that later on with the type of uh, instrumentation that we're using now. Um, over uh, the, the first decade or so of, of its hi history, uh, basically, all the technology development was involved in making the scanner go faster and the signal processing keep up, um, and then doing, uh, doing some functional uh, additions to it. So actually here, what's going on here is we're looking at a flow of, of the uh, blood flowing through this small animal's heart by looking at the Doppler shifts associated with it, and I'll talk about how that works in a minute. And then there were several clinical applications, and so this was one of the first endoscopes. Uh, OCT through an endoscope, looking through, uh, this was actually a, a catheter that was in through, inserted through the working channel of a standard uh, gastrointestinal endoscope, and imaging in the front part of the eye, that's actually somebody's iris and cornea that we're going to look at there. Birefringence imaging was introduced in this time. If we simply build two parallel OCT systems at orthogonal polarizations, we can actually back out from the relative phase uh, that we detect uh, the birefringence of the sample in three dimensions as well. However, there was a big problem. 
Um, oh, I wanted to mention this too. Uh, the wavelengths where this type of work is done for clinical applications has really been limited to, to, telecom, to sort of a history of telecom wavelengths. Um, basically, most of the imaging in the eye is done at 830 because there we have very, almost no absorption. We need to go through, uh, uh, through two and a half centimeters of eye in order to get to the retina, uh, so we don't want to have any absorption at all in water. Most of the imaging in gastroenterolog gastroenterological and cardiac applications where what you want to see through highly scattering tissues tends to be done at the 1310 nanometer window because there, even though you have an order of magnitude more absorption, the absorption is still small compared to the scattering, and scattering going as a decreasing function of wavelength is less at 1310 than it is at 830. But nobody really ever images anything at 1550. I wish we did, because sources would be a whole lot easier there. Because there we have another log order of absorption increase. And so here we have enough absorption that even if you, a, few, uh, a few tens of microns is water of a, is enough to kill your signal totally. And anything living has a few tens of microns of water above what you want to image. So for those that in the room uh, that are interested in, in source development with applications, uh, that's why I stuck that in there. OK, so the problem with what I just described, so you know, what I just described was, fairly, was actually fairly successful. And, and the first 10 years of, the, of that exponential increase in publications was based on that technology I just showed. However, it had a fundamental flaw, and that, which we only discovered in the last five years or so. And that is that it was inefficient. Um, this simple Michelson interferometer has the SNR of a standard, any, any standard heterodyne detector. And that is that the reference power cancels out, where basically our SNR is limited by the, the power reflected from the sample and divided by the bandwidth with which we're detecting uh, that power. It's a factor of two away from direct detection. It's a heterodyne technique. This is assuming we're in the shot noise limit, which we're always careful to make sure that we are. Now, if we're in the shot noise limit, what happens is when we're doing this interferometry to detect light, uh, constructive interference from some depth inside the sample, we're actually using destructive interference to not see light reflected from all the other depths inside the sample. That's how we're actually getting the, image, the images that we get. By scanning the reference mirror and monitoring the signal that we get, we're actually moving a, a sort of the corresponding position in the sample up and down. So while we're still illuminating the whole sample, we're only collecting information from one depth of it at a time because we're doing the interference in the, in the physical world. In, in, in some tissues, that's OK. But in particular, in retinal imaging, in lots of tissues, we're limited in how much light we can actually shine on the sample before we hurt it. And that's particularly true in the retina. We're very strictly limited in how much light we can shine on the retina. We want to be able to image in the retina as fast as possible. We want to be able to get three-dimensional images in, in a few seconds if we could. We can't do it with the technology I just described because of this inefficiency, because we're basically serializing the detection in all three dimensions. So it's a fundamental inefficiency, which it took us a decade to realize we had and, 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 uh, and how to get around. And the way to get around it is using what's called uh, Fourier domain OCT techniques. So basically, these techniques were not actually new. They were actually introduced in the mid-90s. But it wasn't until uh, late 2003 uh, that they were really appreciated for, for having this, this advantage, this dramatic advantage. I'm going to spend a minute on this, because this is what we do now. And I want, I, want to, I want to talk about this in several different ways. The Fourier domain approach to OCT basically involves, I'll describe what the difference between these two is in just a minute, but collecting the whole spectral interferogram of interference between the sample and the reference instead of allowing them to constructively and destructively interfere. Uh, there are actually two different methods of doing this. One is to use the same broadband source that we use in time domain OCT, but park the reference, don't scan the reference anymore. Instead, gain back that degree of freedom by detecting the interference on a spectrometer, so spectrally resolving the interference between the two. The other way to get exactly the same data, which it wasn't really appreciated at first, but actually, but now it is, get exactly the same data by having a narrow band source which sweeps in wavelength over the same range that this one it emits at all the time, and a single channel detector. Either way, you can collect a whole spectral interferogram. So here's a spectral interferogram collected as a function of k. This is close to, but not quite exactly the same thing as the, uh, the power spectral density I mentioned early on. OK, it's a power spectral density, but it's been modulated by interference between the sample, all of the reflections in the sample, and the reference. That, that, that may be a complex function. What we collect here is a real function. What we actually collect is the spectral interferogram of light returning from the sample and the reference. We do a Fourier transform of it, and we get something that looks very much like the depth-resolved reflectivity map that we got in time domain OCT, except we've got some artifacts sitting on top of it. But first, let's point out the good news. If you actually look out from DC to some maximum frequency, 
for every fringe frequency and, and wavelength corresponding to one sample position, you get, a, a, you get a peak. And for different sample positions, you'll get different peaks. And so you'll get a map of reflectivity versus depth. The only problem is you've got some artifacts in here because you're collecting only the real part of the spectral interferogram. You get two artifacts. One of them is there's a big DC component, obviously, there. So you get a big DC component sitting there at DC. The other problem is if you take the Fourier transform of a real function, you get a complex symmetric function, as you know. And so you get a whole negative frequencies of information that mirror the positive frequencies of information. And I, we've actually spent a long, several groups have spent a long time trying to deal with these issues. The way to deal with this issue, of course, is to actually collect the imaginary part of the spectrum. You can do that by delaying the reference delay by, by a, by a, quarter, by a half, half, uh, half wave round trip. Collecting it again, that's the imaginary part. Take the complex inverse Fourier transform and you get a nice complex conjugate resolved map. In fact, nobody does this yet. Pr methods to do that that are practical haven't really, haven't really been worked out uh, yet. What, in fact, most systems that are in use today do is actually just ignore the negative frequencies, just plot the positive frequencies, and keep the patient away from DC. Uh, the problem is, if the patient wanders into DC, then you get two copies of the patient, and they overlap, and you can't, you can't tell them apart again. OK. Um, there are some other artifacts having to do with autocorrelation between different reflectors in the sample. Uh, the, 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 these are all really interesting topics, and there's actually lots of papers on each of these one, but I'm going to sort of skip by these to get to the, to the, to the newer stuff, uh, if you'll allow me, and I'd be glad to, to answer or, or refer you to, to other work later on. One other thing I want to mention, phase. When we do this inverse Fourier transform, we get phase for free. This is real optical phase, and we're going to use it later on to do phase resolved measurements in a very cheap and simple way. Okay. Okay, I wanted to point out the source of the SNR improvement. Uh, this is going back to these SNR expressions again. This is the SNR expression I had on the previous slide. That's, of course, the ratio between the peak signal power, which in the, which in the, cross, uh, the cross term of an interference has to do with reference arm uh, power. There it is, reference arm power and sample arm power. And here's the bandwidth of our detection. So it was, imagine we had a time domain OC interferometer where we swept the, swept the reference delay over some some period of time and collected a depth resolved reflectivity map, an A scan. And we want to take that same amount of time to collect the information using, these, using one of these Fourier domain techniques. When the spectrometer based technique, what we do is for that whole time, we just have the same amount of power on the sample. So we're not gaining anything there, but we actually get the average in, in each detector in the spectrometer over that whole collection time. And so our detection bandwidth goes down. So we get a factor of M here, an improvement where M is basically the number of independent channels we detect over. It can be a thousand, it could be a hundred or a thousand. In the swept source case, we actually sweep the source wavelength quickly. So if you look at about each spectral channel, its bandwidth didn't change because it's only illuminated over a, a, a fraction of that total A scan collection time. But we get to turn our source up by that same factor of M because we're only illuminating one spectral channel at a time. Again, we get this factor of M. And so here we get the whole, this factor of M, which really is a factor of 1,000. In practical terms, we really only get on the order of a factor of 100 out of it for a couple of, a couple of different interesting reasons. But it's nonetheless a factor of 1520 dB that we can get. It's embarrassing this happened 10 years into the development of OCT. Um, you know, from an engineer's point of view, it's not very often in your career you get, you get 20 dB. Most engineers fight their whole lives for you know, one or two. right? Uh, so it's embarrassing and fun at the same time. Uh, and of course, we, we, we do really get this. So here's some pretty pictures, and I'm going to talk about some details of how these systems are built now. What this technology has really enabled us to do is go from 2D to 3D. And so whereas it took us on the order of a, uh, <clears throat> um, a few seconds to get a very high quality two-dimensional image using the, the, the reference arm scanning technique, now it takes us a few seconds to get a three-dimensional Im image data set, sampled it pretty well, sampled it at 512 cube, for example. Uh, in, in five or 10 seconds, we can get a nice densely sampled cube with micron sampling and micron resolution in all of these different applications. OK. Let me show you a couple of, uh, a little bit more detail. Oh, I, I did just stick this slide in, because I, I was hoping there might be some laser developers here uh, who wanted to know what they can do to help uh, OCT. Um, th there's the, the, the figures of merit for a light source for OCT uh, depend on which met method that you're using. And actually what's going on is that the, as I'm going to talk about next, the spectrometer-based approach using a broadband light source has really been the one that has taken off. There's now 10 companies offering uh, commercial systems and competing for, for the ophthalmic and other, and other emerging markets uh, using this technology, basically using the spectrometer-based technique I just described. The light sources required there 
aren't very sophisticated. You, you need all the, all the bandwidth you can get and all the power you can get in a single mode fiber uh, for as cheap as you, for, for a couple of, couple of thousand dollars. Uh, and, and that's p pretty much been done. The next frontier is really using these, developing these swept sources. And I'm not a developer of such sources, so I'm not going to show any, anything further than just give you, the, give you what the figures of merit are here. Um, if you wanted, there is a potential to do much better using swept sources uh, for a couple of different reasons. First of all, uh, you can go much faster. And so the rate with which we can image using the spectrometer-based systems are limited by the integration time of the arrays that we're detecting the spectrum with. Um, so we can go to tens of kilohertz and maybe even hundreds of kilohertz using one-dimensional arrays that we can buy right now. But going much faster than that is, is going to be harder. With a swept source, if you can make a source that sweeps over a broad bandwidth at megahertz or tens of megahertz, then you can image that much faster. Okay? Uh, that's important. The other figure, of, so first figure of matter is bandwidth you can sweep over. Sweep rate is the next one. You need to go really fast. And so there's been a lot of really excellent work being done on, on rapidly swept sources. And I think it's fair to say, some of you may, may know better and disagree, that, that, that actually the development of rapidly swept sources has pushed rapid swept sources, uh, for OCT, has pushed rapid swept source development, at least in the, in the, in the hands of, of those that are developing, for example, the Fourier domain mode locking techniques. There's one other figure of merit, though, that you have to keep in mind, which is why I put this slide in here. If you think of the spectrum that we're collecting as being a product um, of the light source uh, power spectrum and some interference term that you're trying to detect, that gets convolved with the line shape of either the spectrometer you're using, if you're using a spectrometer, or the, li or the instantaneous line width of the laser you're using if you're sweeping a laser. Because you're convolving with that line shape in the, in the, in the Fourier domain, in the time domain, um, what you're doing is multiplying by the inverse uh, Fourier transformer of that line shape, which means that reflectors far away from DC are attenuated compared to reflectors close to DC because they have higher fringe frequencies. And as you get higher and higher fringe frequencies, your finite resolution doesn't see them, sees them worse and worse. So the further and further away from DC you get, the higher fringe frequencies you have, and the more they get attenuated by the system. And so the last figure of merit, and, and really the killer for, sor for laser source development is, you need to have very narrow instantaneous uh, line width, hopefully uh, uh, centimeters of coherence length. At the same time, you have these megahertz uh, sweep rates over hundreds of nanometers. So if you've got ideas about how to do that, um, please pursue them, because that would, uh, would really push this forward very well. OK, I'm going to switch back to the spectrometer-based techniques, because those, those are the ones that have really generated the most exciting uh, applications so far. Here's an example of, of sort of a current generation um, uh, spectrometer-based uh, system for imaging of the retina. This actually, although we developed this a couple of years ago, it's pretty much exactly the same thing that's at the heart of all of the current commercial instruments that are doing this. Uh, we start with the semiconductor light source. This happens to be one that's very popular at the moment because it's available for a few thousand dollars. It has basically 50 nanometer full with half bandwidth and a few milliwatts of output. We can only shine about 0.7 milliwatts CW into the eye, and so we only need a few milliwatts of power output. Uh, Michelson interferometer. Here's some steering optics to steer this beam into the back of the eye. Uh, these are really don't have to be very sophisticated because we're not, we're not doing adaptive optics here, although there are groups that are. We're, ju we're just building a simple ophthalmoscope. And then the detection here, as I mentioned, this is actually a high-speed uh, line, line scan camera. And it was actually the availability of these machine, machine vision cameras uh, about six or seven years ago that really, that really pushed this, this technology to the forefront. Uh, you can now get these up to a few hundred kilohertz uh, line scan rates. Uh, still, the, the basis of most of these systems is on the order of, uh, uh, we actually use a, a, a 50 mil, uh, microsecond integration time, 20 kilohertz A scan rate. So what we do then is we detect interferograms here, 20,000 kilohertz, so 20,000 per second. That is a pretty substantial data rate, so you have to, you have to handle that. Uh, we, have, we want to display these images in real time, so you have to be able to process them. What that gives us then, so 20,000 depth scans per second. If we want an image to have 1,000 lines in it, that's 20 images per second. And if we want to build up a volume that has maybe 100 uh, B scans in it, that's maybe six seconds, so pretty reasonable acquisition time. Um, there it is right there. And if you want to display this real, and this is frankly the reason I started my company, was to get somebody to write good software that could give us images in real time, you need to do quite a bit of processing kind of in real time. It also turns out that the availability of these cameras happens to be about the same time that, that, that computers got to the speed where we could actually do all these processes in real time and actually generate images um, in real time. So, the, so the, the end result here is that the resolution we can achieve with these systems depends on the light source. Using this light source right here of, of 50 nanometers, that's about 5 uh, microns when divided by the index of water. 
to estimate the resolution in tissue. Uh, we actually built the system to support broader bandwidth than that, to support about 150 nanometer bandwidth. And so at, 100, at 100, uh, 105 nanometer light source, which is just a more expensive superluminescent diode, a couple of them stuck together, we get on the order of three and a half microns uh, axial resolution in tissue. All of this with about 105 uh, dBs uh, sensitivity, which is important for getting reasonable image quality. And here's this fall off in intensity. In a spectrometer-based system, your pixels are forced to be equally spaced and also to be as wide as the distance between them. This is a limitation that you don't have in sweeping a source, and that's another reason why a swept source would be a nicer approach if you could get really agile and, and narrow band swept sources. Okay, so what do we do with these 20 images per second? Here's an image of, uh, example of imaging in the retina. This is the lab system that we built a couple of years ago. Uh, this is actually the, the image consisting of 512 pixels in depth by 1,000 pixels across. It's being acquired at 20 images per second. What we're doing is raster scanning that beam across the back of the, across somebody's retina. Um, it turns out that if you axially sum each of these depth scans, you get this image, which looks a lot like a scanning laser ophthalmoscope. In fact, it is just a scanning laser ophthalmoscope. So at the same time we're collecting this 3D data, we're actually automatically generating a two-dimensional surface image of the structure that we're looking at. But it is really three-dimensional data. It's a few hundred megabyte data set, but we can, it looks now like an MRI or CT data set, and we can use all the same tools for slicing and dicing these data sets uh, that, that, that radiologists uh, conventionally use. And so, um, and so we do. Um, let me just mention quickly what the, what the image quality uh, lets us see. Uh, this is an unaveraged image acquired in a 20th of a second. This is an average image averaged over a second or two of acquisition. Uh, you, you, because we don't have instantaneous acquisition, we, knew, we, still, have to, we still have to trade off between imaging fast, uh, imaging with high quality, and imaging whole volumes of, of tissue. And that's, that's a debate that's going on in the acquisition uh, community. But this is, this is a highly average image of a, of a human retina. Uh, by the way, there are, th there are thousands of instruments out in the field now. If you go to an ophthalmologist in the US or Japan now with any kind of eye problem, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get one of these. Uh, but what, what we can actually see in here is actually quite amazing. And so the, the retina, as you know, is, 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 is three neural layers of brain. There's uh, photoreceptors down here, uh, intermediary neurons here, and, um, and ganglion cells up here. The actual photoreceptors, so the rods and cones are actually in this void between, between these two lines. We can actually resolve subcellular level detail having to do with the photoreceptor cells, which go from here to here. They're not, not actually separate. The rods and cones, actually outer segments, are in this void right here. Other parts of the cells are otherwise displaced. You can see capillary networks. There we go. These are actually capillary networks at different layers inside the retina. Uh, this is in living human retinas now. We can actually see with this almost this logical level of detail uh, routinely in patients, not just in, 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 in still people. Um, one of the things my company did was actually build the optics to do this in mice. Uh, mice don't see very well, so this actually is harder than it sounds. Um, but what that lets you do is then get histology and actually compare one to one uh, what you can see uh, that actually you can actually see each of these individual uh, uh, resolution layers that you can see uh, in the retina. And let me let me go uh, over this. Um, okay, so I, I was going to talk for just a second about about the clinical applications of this. I know you're not very interested in clinical ophthalmology, but I just wanted to get to the point of saying this is where our technology, uh, as of five years ago, uh, got, got us. Um, once you start making this available to physicians, of course, they want to know what they can, what they can do with it. Um, and one of the first things you want to do with it is compare what you see with this kind of technology to standard ophthalmic technologies. So for example, here's an image of a patient with, a, uh, with advanced uh, age-related macular degeneration, which is a terrible disease. It's a blinding disease. Uh, it corresponds to this, this in this one, a, uh, this one B scan here, a severe elevation of the retina. But there's several different things going on in here. They all have special names that you probably don't really care about. But what we actually did, one of the first things we did with this technology was go in there, go slice by slice through each of these hundred slices making up this tissue volume, and mark on each one where each of these different pathologies was happening. So for example, these red dots here are mar marking the bo borders of the uh, cortical neovascularization where the, where the vascular networks are actually spilling into where they shouldn't be. The edema is marked in yellow here, the edges of the, uh, of the retinal uh, thickening uh, there in, in green and the subretinal fluid in blue. If we then sum these colors back up, we actually get maps of where the boundaries of these various different things are happening. And then if we compare those maps to standard ophthalmic exams, this is, and this was just published last year, this is a standard fluorescein experiment. If you've been to an ophthalmologist, they've injected you with fluorescent material, and then they watch how the fluorescence leaks out of your retinal vasculature. It turns out that where it leaks is corresponds to the border of just the 
retinal pigment epithelium disruption and not each of these other boundaries that we were able to identify. We weren't really sure of that before. If you do a visual field test, which is where you stick your head in this big box and they shine these really dim lights in there and you can barely see them, it's very subjective. It turns out that the edges of where your vision gets hampered, this patient in particular, was actually all the way out at the edge of the very edge of the retinal thickening, and which also wasn't really known where this happens versus where this happens before. This technology, so this is just one example of how this technology is affecting ophthalmic practice. It's helping us understand other standard ophthalmic technologies and frankly starting to displace them because now that we understand what these ones are, each of these are sort of a subset of what we can see with the OCT data. The last slide I have on the clinical applications is, is this one, uh, which is where I sort of give up. And so here's an example, uh, here are two examples of other uh, retinal diseases where we have these beautiful three-dimensional data sets. And what we really want to know now is, we wanna, is what the physicians want to know is they want to quantify the pathologies that are going on in each of these cases. So for example, here's a case of, uh, of another uh, patient with uh, choroidal neovascularization where the thickness of this particular layer, which happens to be the photoreceptor cell layer, of the, of the retina was thought to have been damaged. So what we really want to do is develop software to go in there and automatically segment out that layer and give us a map over the whole retina of how that layer is, is changing. So we do this in my lab. We go through a slice at a time and have an undergraduate sitting there drawing circles <laughs> over each of these things. And then we put, you know, it takes three hours. You put the whole thing back together, you get one map of this. Meanwhile, over in the medical center, the technician's pushing the button to acquire these data sets every six seconds. And so, you know, who's winning? Uh, they are. So, my point here is basically now we are no longer at the point where the technology is driving this. What, re what we really need is image processing expertise to come in and automate these processes and quantify what we're seeing. So that kind of gets out of my, my ballpark. Um, so let me change subject then. Uh, uh, oh, this is just a slide showing. The, the, um, the time domain OCT was actually commercialized out of MIT, out of Jim Fujimoto's lab in, in, uh, in 1995, and there was one instrument with this new generation of technologies in the last two years, there's been an explosion. There's basically at least these seven and probably more like 14 or 15 companies that are now selling competitive systems. There was also a big IP opening up that happened when, when this happened that contributes to this, but this has really been a, an impressive thing. <clears throat> Let me skip ahead. I'm using all my time talking too much. Okay, so, so what are we gonna do while these physicians are off uh, taking their image, images and the image processors are helping them figure it out? Well, all we've done so far is back reflection of tissue, of, of, of scattering. We just resolved where scattering is coming from in tissue. Wouldn't it be nice if we could develop other sources of contrast to image with, with this light-based technique? Now, the first thing, of course, you think about is what, what micros, microscopists use all the time, which is fluorescence. Unfortunately, we can't see fluorescence because it's incoherent scattering and we've got a coherent detection technique. We need a fixed phase relationship between the light going in and the light coming back in order to be able to, re to reject all of that light that we don't want that's, that's, been, back, that's been multiply scattered. We need a coherent, sca a coherent scattering process to detect. Now, my group and several others have actually done quite a bit of work on using um, e uh, inelastic coherent scattering processes, including stimulated emission process related processes, scattering off of nanoparticles where we're modulating their location to, to modulate the scattering to try to get molecular specific uh, imaging with OCT with some, with some success. I didn't come prepared to talk about that today. The simplest, actually, uh, contrast enhanced method for OCT is imaging of, of flow. So I wanted to talk about that for a minute. Flow, uh, uh, where am I? That jumped. Uh, flow is the simplest use, use of phase uh, in OCT. I'm sorry, this actually isn't a very good slide. I need a more simple explanation slide of, of how to do uh, uh, Doppler in OCT. It's actually quite simple. If you think of, here's an image it's an M-mode image, so it's actually repeated depths acquired over time in the same position. Remember, each depth information we get from a Fourier transform of the spectrum, and what we've been plotting so far in all these images is the amplitude. And so we get amplitude images of scattering. However, we have phase information as well. That phase is real optical phase, so we actually have at each depth in that tissue the phase at the moment in time when that depth scan was taken. That's great. If we actually take repeated A scans at that same location over time, and then we actually calculate the slope of the phase over time, that's a D slope, that's a D phase D time, that's a frequency. Frequency is the Doppler shift frequency if, that's, if that position is actually changing. So if, that, if that, something is in there moving, it's going to be generating a phase that differs over time. That's going to give us a Doppler shift. Doppler shift here. If we know the angle with which we're 
illuminating that, ob that object. We can back out the velocity with which it's moving. That's really quite simple. And so the first implementation of Doppler here is actually just doing this phase processing. So all we do is actually look at the slope of the phase at each position over time, plot that as a color scale image, just like in color Doppler ultrasound, and then overlay it on top of the grayscale image. What this ha actually happens, this is a, 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 one of our interests is in imaging of developmental biology processes. One of our favorite models is the chick. The chicken happens to be the, the, the sort of earliest animal that has a four-chambered heart. So there's a lot of work going on in understanding how four-chambered hearts develop by using chickens. Um, here's a, and because they're easy to do, you just break open the, break open the shell and there they are. Uh, this is an image of, of, of part of the heart of a chicken taken over time with the Doppler processing um, 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 applied, uh, sh uh, showing what the Doppler images look like. If now, um, and, and so there's just a slide about, about doing that. Now, what do we want to do with this? We can actually now get frequency information, and if we actually know the direction in which things are flowing, velocity information everywhere in these three-dimensional volumes that we got the backscattering information from before. So that's kind of useful. That means we can do neat things. So here, for example, is a Doppler, a, a volume acquisition through part of the chamber of this developing heart in a chicken. Um, if we actually do all the work to collect that velocity information, go through there slice by slice and mark out where the, where the, where the uh, borders of the vessel were, so we know that's actually the vessel we're talking about, we can then go back in there at any point and look and say, at that point in time, my flow was such and such, and here's how it varied um, over time. This is actually a technique that we, we sort of borrowed from, from, uh, from, Doppler from ultrasound Doppler velocimetry and applied to OCT. We call it uh, uh, spectral Doppler velocimetry. What it gives us is, by doing all this work to find out the directionality that basically the Doppler angle, we can actually get velocity information at any point um, in the flow. That's, that's, a, that's a nice thing. Uh, this is on the micron scale again. What we've used this for so far is actually understanding biomechanical models of the heart development. And so for, I don't want to go into much detail here, but for example, uh, uh, there's a sort of current debate going on about whether the developing heart is a peristaltic pump or actually a, a real uh, a pulsatal pump. That depends in, a lot in, in detail on, on the modeling of how you do this. It turns out that there's some artificial structures that all of our hearts have in the embryo called uh, car car cardiac uh, jelly. Uh, nobody really understands very well why they're there, uh, except we might, because if, you, if they're there, uh, they generate pulsatile looking flow that looks a lot like what we see in the laboratory as opposed to if they're not there uh, biomechanically, they, they don't. So sorry for that bad explanation uh, of, of, of that very poorly, but here's just one example of the application. Um, <clears throat> this type of Doppler imaging um, has been uh, useful so far, but it turns out to be quite sensitive to motion. And the reason we've only done, shown, uh, the reason I only showed you this, this data in a chicken shell that was sitting nice and still is if the, if the subject is moving, it turns out that we can't tell the flow in the chicken vessel from the flow of the whole chicken itself, okay, because it's very sensitive to motion. So there's been further developments in this. We are very actively involved in, in trying to figure out ways to isolate the motion uh, of, the, of the things that are moving within the volume from the actual volume itself being moving. Um, and so we've actually just published this new technique. There's a group of, 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 of groups uh, working very hard on this, and so uh, we're not alone in this. We're, uh, they're also Ricky Wang at, uh, or at University of Oregon and a, gr and a couple of groups in Japan are, are, are doing work on this. But, but we're generating, I think, useful, useful information. If we try to do a, a, a three-dimensional map of the flow going through, uh, in this case, a, a, a piece of skin, uh, it turns out that the we can color code for velocity, but the information we get is, is kind of disjoint and this is because of the motion of the sample. There's a signal processing approach we can use, which borrows heavily from work, that, the work that's been done previously, which is uh, if we use this technique, what we do here is we actually dramatically oversample in the lateral dimension. So here's a map of spectrum versus distance where we've oversampled this, this, this spectrum a lot in the lateral, we've oversampled in the spatial direction by quite a bit. Now normally in, in Doppler processing what we do is we do a vertical Fourier transform through the spectrum, get the phase over repeated acquisitions, take the slope of that phase, use that to get our, our frequency. The trick here is actually to oversample a lot enough in the lateral dimension that before we do the vertical Fourier transform we can do a horizontal Hilbert transform. The idea there is if we take a horizontal slice of this at a fixed k, the original person who proposed doing this just did the Hilbert transform. So you take a horizontal transform, 
window out the negative frequencies, inverse transform back, that gives you an estimation of the, f of the phase at every point along this axis, just a Hil Hilbert estimation of phase. What we do is a slight modification of that. We actually do an estimation of phase for each spectral window so that we can actually resolve uh, flow. What this does is give us an estimation of the phase at every point along this dimension, such that when we come in in the next step into our vertical Fourier transform, we've already got an estimate of the local phase, which encodes the difference between whether that the whole tissue is moving or just a little piece of tissue is moving, which is what we're after. What this is, it basically is a form of power Doppler imaging. Uh, it gives a sensitivity to the uh, power encompassed within a spectral window as opposed to trying to do a phase <coughs> slope measurement, which tends to be very noisy. And it gives us information such as is illustrated here. So this actually is also a still sample. I'll show you an in vivo sample in just a minute. Uh, this is the, uh, the skin on the back of a mouse, which is exposed uh, by having a window placed over it. Uh, this is actually a mosaic image that took about half an hour of data acquisition to get. But actually, by doing this technique, we can now resolve down to about 15 micron, just above capillary level flow, and see thousands of vessels in living tissue like this. And it's actually applicable to in vivo as well. So the last thing I'm going to show you here um, is an in vivo measurement in ret back in retina. So we can finally do this in retina. Here's one of these retinal ophthalmoscope images uh, that, that I've shown before, where we've gone in here now and taken individual tiny slices uh, here that are great, that are oversampled enough to basically be enough that the patient can tolerate it. So these took about 30 seconds apiece, which is about as much as anybody can keep their eye open comfortably. But they enable us to resolve these individual vessels in the retina. And then what I'm going to zero in on here, this is the fovea. The fovea, of course, is where you're looking when you look at something. Uh, the fovea, I've shown some of the morphology of it before. The vascular nature of the fovea is it's actually avascular. And that is that the vessels get smaller and smaller. And then there's a central avascular zone in the middle of the fovea because you don't want blood vessels in the middle of what you're looking at. Uh, with this technique, we're actually able to go in here and resolve vessels down to about 15 micron diameter. Each of these individual little just above capillaries, we can actually resolve the flow through. We can actually show they have parabolic flow in each individual one. In fact, the way we get these, these widths is by fitting a parabolic function and looking for the zero crossings. So they're pretty good estimates of the, of the diameter of each vessel. We have quantitative three-dimensional uh, information about the flow. We can actually sum up all of the flow going into the, into the fovea, which we've done over here, and all the flow coming out of the fovea. Uh, we got almost the same number, so we're getting almost all the vessels, but obviously not exactly all of them. Um, so this is just pushing this Doppler information uh, kind, of, kind of further and further. Um, I think that's actually all I was going to show. I, bet I, had, I had some more slides about the, uh, the phase contrast microscopy we were doing, but I think I've used up all my time. So, uh, yes? <laughs> we actually haven't done anything very new here for, for a little while. Um, do, do you mind if I take another five minutes and talk, about, talk, through the, uh, talk about this a little bit? I'll abbreviate this a little bit. Okay, the last thing I was going to do was, was change gears and talk about phase microscopy. We have just a little tiny thing, I think, to add to microscopy, which I'm embarrassed to talk to real microscopists about because we're so poor at lateral resolution. It's the axial, uh, it, it, it has to do with axial <coughs> resolution. It turns out that using exactly the same instrumentation that we developed, and it's now been widely commercialized, and it's actually fairly cheap and easy to make for OCT, we can do phase microscopy uh, with, with nanometer uh, scale accuracy quite, quite easily in the far field. This is just a review of previous work. Um, what I'm talking about here is resolving the phase. This phase information that we get basically for free, if we use it correctly, let me uh, get to the good part here. If we rebuild this interferometer that I talked about before, um, but we build it in a phase, as phase-stable a manner as we can, and that is we get rid of the reference arm, and we actually just use a, a part of the sample as, it's, as, a refer, as a reference. So say, for example, there's a sample arm. We have some cells sitting on a cover slip. If we actually use, if we don't, um, don't AR coat the bottom of that cover slip so we get a healthy reflection off of it, then that can serve as a, re, as a reference reflection for the reflections coming from the cells sitting on the top. Now we've got a pretty phase-stable uh, situation. The only possible phase noise can come in, in what's going on inside the cover slip, no matter what's happening with these fibers out here. There's no moving parts. This is a, uh, a solid-state source, a, a sitting still uh, spectrometer. What happens is, if we actually monitor the phase uh, that we, so what we do, we, we see a reflection from, from something on top of the cover slip that we're interested in. We, we use the intensity, we use the amplitude information to localize that reflection, then we monitor the phase at that position. If we monitor the phase over time, in the case of a cover slip, what we actually find is that the phase 
Uh, and then we multiply the phase by a factor to give us out what actual displacement we're looking at. A few milliradians of phase resolution gives us on the order of 50 picometers of displacement resolution. So we actually were, in this case, resolving the thickness of a cover slip over the diameter of a diffraction limited beam of a few microns to within, you know, better than the diameter of an atom, averaged, of course, over a few micron uh, spot size. Um, that's for a cover slip where we have really healthy reflections from the top and the bottom. If we go to a scanning situation where we're actually looking at a, uh, this is an Air Force test chart, what we did is just use uh, a, a cover slip sitting on top of the Air Force test chart. Now the noise out here is on the order of a few nanometers. But nonetheless, using this very simple system, which is really just a, a commercial OCT system and a, and, a, and a simple far field, not even very good microscope, we can get nanometer scale uh, spatial displacement information quite readily. And so the kind of things that you know, us amateurs and microscopists have done with this to play around with it have been looking at cells. So here's a cell. This is actually a, a, a cardiac myocyte. Uh, cardiac myocytes isolated will actually beat on their own. In part of that beating, they're, they're, the, the, the upper cell membrane actually moves a little bit with respect to the bottom one. If we put our, 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 our beam right there and just monitor as a function of time, the phase difference between the reference, which is what the cell is sitting on, and the top of the cell, we actually see displacements here. In this case, they're a couple hundred nanometers. They were really big displacements. But we have great time resolution, 20 kilohertz, so 50 microsecond time resolution we can do this with. Uh, we can see uh, easily a few hundred nanometer displacements. Um, the other things we've done are we've actually uh, glued little uh, magnetic particles onto the surfaces of cells and then pulled on them with an electromagnet sitting here. So we actually monitor the, uh, the dynamics of the cellular mechanics. That is, we pull on the top, we see how, how and when it expands. Uh, we can go, I'm sorry to be flashing through these slides. We can actually go ahead and, and do some drug manipulations of these cells. So I, what we, these were uh, cancer cells, MCF7 cancer cells. We actually gave them a drug that uh, that, um, that depolarized the actin filaments, made them sort of floppier, looser. And in fact, they responded the right way. They, they got looser, they got easier to stretch. Um, and of course, we could do this in real time and of course, correlate this to, to biomechanical uh, models of, of, of what's actually going on inside the cell. I think I had one more example, which is a bit of a fun one to show. Uh, this, I think, is the highest resolution interferometric Doppler imaging uh, that's been done. So by simply displacing the beam going through our objective a little bit, we could get a bit of an angle going through the cell um, with the idea of doing Doppler flow measurements of cytoplasm in cells. What we applied this to in this case was um, an amoeba. And this movie for some reason isn't working. So when an amoeba actually moves, what it does is send out a little channel of cytoplasm to cause its, its uh, tip to, to move. And that's how it moves back and forth. Um, and so there's this little channel there. So what we did was actually put our beam right there and uh, see if we could see that flow in a, in a Doppler sense. If you didn't understand my explanation of how this works, this is actually probably the best uh, des descriptor of it. What we did was at the position of that little red dot, do repeated A scans at 20 kilohertz. Here's the intensity of that reflection. So here's the cover slip, here's the cell, and here's the top of the cell, maybe 80 microns higher, over 40 seconds of acquisition time. At the same time we are doing this, we can also plot the phase. So here's the phase corresponding to the cover slip and the phase corresponding to the top of the cell and whatever's going on inside. You can already see what's happening here. Something is changing. There's a channel of flow right around there where the phase is changing. If we take the slope of that phase and plot it, what we actually see is, 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 is this cross-sectional uh, velocity time map now. What actually happened here was, and I'm sorry this movie isn't working anymore, there's a channel of flow going in here. What we did was watch the flow going in here as we let the cell live there. We actually put in a little calcium chloride over here, which the cell doesn't like. It retracted, so it actually started the flow, went started to going backwards, and so that gave us negative flow uh, going there. We were actually looking here on the order of, of, of a few microns per second flow of cytoplasm in a cell using, using a Doppler, using, using the same technique as they chase you down on the highway with. Uh, okay, well, let me stop there. Uh, in conclusion, I. I hope I've, I've shown that OCT is fun and exciting. Um, let me uh, not, uh, not uh, forget to thank my collaborators, uh, most especially my students and postdocs uh, who are listed. Here's a long list. They aren't all here anymore, but, uh, but some, some, some of them are. And especially my collaborations. A lot of this work is done in collaboration with several ophthalmology groups, not only at Duke, but also at USC uh, and UC Davis. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Uh, of course we don't. No, we're only measuring the, 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 the perpendicular component, or the parallel component to our beam. So the only way we can get veloc real velocities is we have to take a 3D image, segment out the vessels, and measure their angle at each point so we can then go back and estimate what the flow was. So you're, you're finding tilted vessels, and those are the ones you're measuring the aileron? Yeah, absolutely. So if the vessels happen to be perpendicular, you wouldn't be in flow? We wouldn't. Um, we, we arrange things so that they're not. Uh, first of all, the phobia is not exactly, well, we arrange things, well, we arrange things so that they're not. We're, we're very sensitive to, to low flows, too. So we actually are, we're at a very small angle. These are actually just a few degrees uh, that we're seeing, but we're sensitive enough to velocity we can actually, we can still see that. But you're perfectly right. If there wasn't one vessel in there that was absolutely horizontal, uh, perpendicular to our beam, we would, we would simply not see it. And this, in fact, may be a bit of the, 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 the problem we had where the inflow didn't quite match the outflow. Well, they, what I believe, I, actually, there may be a retinal anatomist here who's better than I. My, my understanding is that they, you know, they branch, the, the total flow is conserved. And so they branch down smaller and smaller, but there's more and more of them until they're capillaries. And then they become venules, and they take the flow back out. So the oxygen is diffusing across the boundary, but there's no discontinuity in, in mass, mass conservation. What I'm not entirely sure about is, 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 the, is whether they go like this or they sort of go like, like this, or, or exactly how, how that's oriented, I'm not quite sure. But they do end by the time you get to the center of vision, because if, if, if they were there, you would see float. I mean, they would be just like floaters. You'd see them in focus. Predominantly. Yeah? Um, so, as I understand it, with most of the scenario, you have a deeper and tissue by a factor of two or three, and the people are coming across it. So, is, um, is the reason why ophthalmology? What's interesting about uh, the rather than the Well, so you're revealing a weakness in my chain of argument here. So in fact, in ophthalmology, the reason it's successful is because of your iris. So you have a physical limit to your numerical aperture that limits it to, to f20 or so. Um, so you can only, so if you, the best you can focus on, a, on, the, on the lens, best you can focus on the retina using just the iris, is on the order of, of, of 100 microns or so in depth. So no, no matter, unless you take the eyeball out and separate out the retina, you can't, get, you can't get this level of resolution in the retina. That's the overwhelming reason why OCT is successful in ophthalmology. Um, this factor of two to three that you get uh, of increased depth in highly scattering tissue um, is really only applicable in other, other tissues where that's not a factor. And so uh, in, in these developmental biology studies, for example, or in other applications of OCT, such as in cardiology, gastroenterology, where people are looking for cancer or, 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 or diseases that occur in, in scattering tissues is where that factor of two or three uh, is important. There, I'm still not sure I would make the argument that it's that factor that's making the case for OCT as opposed to multi-photon, for example. Um, I think there it's probably much, a much more mundane argument that it's been so well developed for ophthalmology that it's relatively easy to translate for, for other applications. Uh, multi-photon may do just as well. Um, well, y the way we normally do it, yes. It is a confocal microscope, so you can do it with whatever resolution you, you want. Uh, and there's this whole sort of sub-branch of OCT called optical currents microscopy, where you actually do work hard to focus tightly um, and still maintain the coherence uh, gate at that same depth. The problem then becomes... It's actually becomes, you have two separate things to keep at the same point. You've got to keep your focus at the right point, and you've got to keep the coherence gate exactly matched to it, even though you've got indices varying um, in the tissue above it quite a bit and that are trying to separate it back out. Um, so that's an additional level of difficulty above multi-photon, I would, I would say, uh, that makes it even harder. That was a ram rambling answer to that question, sorry. Unfortunately, we will need to end here, but we'd like to thank you one more time. Oh, thank you.